Hey everybody, Dr. Patel here. Welcome to my Facebook Live. Hope everyone's doing well. Uh, hope you all had a very happy 4th of July. Hope you didn't get in too much trouble. And um, sorry about missing out on last week, but we're back this week talking about the neck. Um, we started a couple weeks ago talking about neck anatomy and the different types of things uh, that can cause neck pain. Uh, we talked about uh, the different parts of the neck and if you're interested in looking back and learning a little bit about the neck anatomy, please go back on our Facebook Live or to our website fxregencenter.com where we have all of our previous live videos uh, taped. Now, moving forward over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about some more neck-related topics. And uh, if you have specific things that you want me to cover, if you have questions uh, about your specific condition or any other things um, about the neck or other body regions, then feel free to comment, DM, or email at us at info at fxregencenter.com. But today, we're going to be talking about neck arthritis. I'm going to talk a little bit about arthritis in general and specifically about the neck, where it happens in the neck, what are the symptoms that are related to neck arthritis, why do they occur, and what exactly can we do about it. And today I'm going to be doing a little bit of a combination of drawing as well as using this nice little digital model here by BioDigital. Um, there are a lot of different models available. I particularly like this one um, because of its ease of use and flexibility, and I hope that you enjoy my using this for demonstration purposes. Let me know if you like it better this way or if you like it better when I'm just drawing on x-rays, images, etc. cetera, and um, we'll adjust as, as you guys see fit. So, um, uh, Doretta mentioned, what is a sound I hear in my neck? Is it like grit or sand? Um, we're going to talk about that, Doretta. Uh, we're going to talk about that and a few other things in terms of what are all the different symptoms that we see? Um, what are associated, what are the symptoms that are associated with, with arthritis? Um, and, and what else uh, can be going on? But just to kind of recap, since it's been a couple of weeks, just to recap a little bit of the anatomy here. Um, this is your head and your neck. Right? And we're going to talk a little bit about the anatomy here as we strip away the different layers. You know, when, when we talk about the neck superficially, we obviously have the, the skin that's surrounding. Um, we have our skull and our jaw. Um, this little bone here is called the hyoid. Um, and then we have a lot of different structures that can be peeled away. We have these big old muscles um, in the back of the neck here. And as we peel away those muscles, there's actually a ton of other uh, muscles below that that we can then peel away and get down to the joints themselves, the bones themselves. Now, when we look here um, at these regions, the spine is consistent of multiple vertebral bodies stacked on top of each other. In the neck, we have seven vertebral bodies. Um, and those vertebral bodies actually go down to, when we think of our neck, we're thinking about kind of like this area here. But in actuality, the neck goes down to kind of the upper back region. And in between those vertebral bodies, we have the discs. Now, those discs, as we've mentioned in previous talks, um, are like shock absorbers. They're like the water balloons that are completely filled with jelly. Um, and those discs uh, provide support from one vertebral body to the next. Now, that's towards the front of the neck. Towards the back of the neck, on either side, we have the facet joints, which is where one bone meets another bone. So you can see this gap, this space between these two areas here. That's called the facet joint. And we have one of these on each side of the neck. So if you look to the other side here, it's gonna be covered by the muscles, but we have them on each side as well, okay? Now, these are the joints where one bone meets another bone. Like many of the joints in our body, this 
bone is covered by a smooth surface um, and has called the cartilage and has kind of a capsule that surrounds it which is made of ligament type structure um, ligament is what attaches bone to bone and this capsule allows for the, that bone to stay uh, close to each other, st uh, allows for those bones to stay um, approximated. And there's a little bit of motion that takes place at those capsules because those ligaments um, are the consistency of those thick rubber bands that surround broccoli in the grocery store. So they're, they're strong, they're supportive, but there's a little bit of stretch to them. And that's really what the joint capsules are, as well as all the other ligaments that are in um, that are connecting bone to bone. If you go further back here, these kind of spikes that we see are the spinous processes. Those are the nubbins that we feel when we press the back of our neck in the midline. Now, you, you may have heard my analogy in the past about calling the vertebral bodies a coffee mug. Well, you can kind of picture that. You can picture that easier in the low back, but you can kind of picture that here with the front being the mug itself and the back being the handle. And where the handle touches the handles above and below it, those are called the facet joints. and We have one on each side. Now, there are other joints in the neck as well. There are what are called uncovertebral joints. And that's really the joint where the edge of the vertebral body can come close to the edge of the vertebral body above it. And although this does not always occur, this is an area where a joint can occur as well. It's a little bit of a different animal than the facet joint, but yet another area where one bone can come in close proximity to or even um, in connection to another bone. Now, We've gone through a little bit of the natural history of degeneration in the past, but I'm gonna go through it again because I think it's important. When, as we get older, that disc, that water balloon, um, starts to lose some of its fluid. It starts to get dehydrated, and that's called disc degeneration. As that dehydration occurs, that does not necessarily cause pain. That's a normal thing as we get older, but there's a little bit of wobbliness there's a little bit of motion that takes place at that disc. And it's not an overt amount of motion. It's not like this vertebral body is completely moving or anything along those lines, but there's a little bit of micro motion that takes place over time, which ultimately causes some friction at the facet joints. As there is friction that takes place on any joint throughout our body over time, the smooth surface called the cartilage starts to wear away. As that smooth surface starts to wear away, the bone underneath the cartilage starts to get a little rougher. As that roughness occurs in the bone, well then the, the, the bone itself can actually do a couple different things. The bone can actually um, bulk up a little bit um, because as there's motion that's taking place, the bone's like, hey, there's starting to be a little bit of instability here. I, I gotta bulk up in order to provide stability where there is not. So the bone can actually start to get a little bulkier. And in some circumstances, that's called a bone spur. The bone can also start to break down. If there's excess pressure over an extended period of time, the bone can actually start to get little dents in it it could start getting bruised appearance. It can start actually um, getting little pockets of inflammation in it called cysts. And, and what's called sclerosis or breaking down of the bone can occur. And over time, that bone can actually start to crumble. And as there is, again, continued pressure into these joints, sometimes we can actually also get some fusion, autofusion that occurs where the bone stops moving because it's starting to get more bulky and the bone actually starts to merge into the bone that it's attached to, uh, where the joint is. Um, and that's kind of like the spectrum of what osteoarthritis is. Osteoarthritis is that wear and tear of a joint, that normal degeneration of a joint that occurs gradually over time and that eventually leads to either breaking down of the bone 
um, or, or eventually some level of autofusion. And that kind of situation occurs in the facet joints as we get older in general. Now, just like the disc degeneration, however, just like the disc degeneration, which does not necessarily equal pain, it is very, very common for us to have degeneration of our joints anywhere in our body, but particularly in the neck, since that's what we're talking about today. It's very common for us to have degeneration and have zero symptoms associated with it. So if osteoarthritis does not necessarily cause pain, well, then what the heck is it that's causing your symptoms, right? So just to kind of show you again, this is the joint here, right? And this joint can start getting bulkier. It can start getting bone spurs or what are called osteophytes. And all of that does not necessarily equal pain. So when that occurs, there's a few different things that come along with that. Number one, as any joint starts to degenerate, its local environment is not as healthy as a joint that has no degeneration. So it may be easier in some circumstances for that joint to get irritated if we are putting abnormal pressure into the joint. So if we're starting to develop arthritis in that joint, and we're doing things that's constantly causing irritation, then, meaning if we're putting ourselves into bad positions, if we're lifting improperly, if we're tweaking our neck, if we're sleeping in incorrect postures over time, these joints can get irritated, and it's easier for a joint to get irritated when it has osteoarthritis. Furthermore, since the environment of the joint is not as healthy, once that joint is irritated, it's easier for that joint to stay irritated because the biology of the joint is no longer able to act or react um, when we have an injury occur. So to kind of backtrack on that thought process, and when, when you have an acute injury occur, um, that's like you know when you uh, twist your ankle or you, you bang your knee or you get a cut, right? that initial part of the reaction of healing that occurs is inflammation. And inflammation is a good thing. It's all your, your body sending your blood platelets to the area to stop the bleeding of a cut, for example. Um, it's sending these big cells called macrophages to the area to start getting rid of the damaged tissues. It's sending your local stem cells to the area to then conduct the orchestra of healing. And that's how healing takes place. But when we have arthritis, the local cells are not as active. And there's some research for particular joints that even show that those cells are not, not as numerous when we have osteoarthritis as as we get older. So in that area, when we get an injury, um, we don't get as great of a response. We can get inflammation, um, but that inflammation lingers instead of coming and going. And the healing response does not fully take place. So one of the ways that a joint that has osteoarthritis bec can become painful is if we do something to irritate it and because that joint cannot respond the way that a normal or, or non-arthritic joint would respond. Um, now another way that a joint that has osteoarthritis can cause irritation is because I mentioned that that joint um, can get bulkier. The bone can get bulkier, right? Um, if that bone starts to get rougher and starts to get thicker, then that bone itself can potentially um, irritate other structures around it. So if that bone is getting bulkier, then the space between that bone and the disc, so the space between this bone and the disc in front of it. So this space right here can start to get narrowed if the bone is getting larger. So let's see what that looks like. If this bone is starting to bulk up 
and get some osteophyte formation, right? you can see how that then narrows the space where the nerve is traveling. Similarly, if this disc starts to bulge, right, and we've talked about disc bulging before, that can also narrow the space where the nerve is traveling. And as that space for the nerve gets narrowed, well then that decreases uh, the space for that nerve and then that nerve can start getting irritated um, because there's pressure being placed on it. Now this narrowing of the space where the nerve is traveling is what's called stenosis and stenosis does not necessarily equal pain um, but again with a narrowed space for the nerve it's easier for that nerve to get irritated and then that can cause symptoms. Now the symptoms associated with nerve irritation we've talked about briefly before, but typically that's not necessarily neck pain, although it can be. It's typically pain, numbness, tingling, weakness that goes down the arms when we're talking about the, the mid to lower nerve roots. It can also be associated with various other symptoms in the upper neck, even into the face or into the head when we talk about the upper nerves. Um, all of these can be associated with the arthritis that takes place in the neck, but not necessarily directly due to. The other thing that occurs with arthritis that's, that's not, again, directly associated with it, but when we start getting changes to the facet joint, the capsule around it and the, the ligament structures around it can start to change. Those ligaments, as they're they're loose with the motion, um, can start to react and get thicker. Those ligament structures can kink down on each other and again cause narrowing of where nerves are traveling. Or the ligaments themselves can start getting injured by things like the bone spurs or, or things like instability in the region. Now again, these are not directly related to the osteoarthritis in the neck, but are a part of the activity that occurs when we have arthritis and degenerative changes. Now, one very, very common thing that people associate with osteoarthritis, again, in general, but again, particularly with the neck, is the concept or symptom of stiffness. So stiffness is something that's actually very commonly associated with osteoarthritis. Um, and there's several theories as to why stiffness actually takes place. But stiffness ultimately has to do with um, the lack of motion in a joint that needs to then get warmed up in order to be able to move more freely. So imagine this, you're sleeping all night or you're sitting in a position for a long period of time and then when you wake up in the morning or you get up to move, you feel some achiness and you feel some um, decreased mobility and as you start moving, as you start walking, um, then things start to loosen up. So that's the pretty prototypical concept of stiffness that occurs in, with neck arthritis and, and with arthritis in any other joint. Now, some theorize that that has to do with the fact that there's now some bulking of the joints that's taking place. There's some, some decreased motion that's taking place in those joints. And when we're sitting or lying down or sleeping for an extended period of time, our joints are kind of getting stuck in the position that they're in. Um, so until you get up and moving and, and, and the lubrication essentially happens in those joints, it feels very stiff and feels very immobile. Um, one of the very common things that we can do to battle that stiffness is when we've been sitting for a long time, doing some stretches, you know, um, getting some motion into the joints that are particularly feeling st uh, stiff can definitely help with, with, with decreasing the stiffness or at least reducing the length of stiffness um, um, as we start getting moving. Um, but you know when we think about osteoarthritis there's the the symptoms that are associated directly with the osteoarthritis such as pain and stiffness and then there's the indirect symptoms that are associated such as nerve irritation and, and, and even things like muscles uh, tightening up. So muscles tighten up because of 
uh, the muscles react to things. Uh, when joints, like the facet joints, are angry, um, the muscles have the tendency to kind of clamp up in order to try to protect for the joint or in reaction to the joint. And that can oftentimes be a part of our pain as well. But when we talk about pain from the joints themselves, we have to be aware that the pain does not necessarily just occur in the joint. So when we think about the joints, really those are on the sides towards the back of our neck and pressing on those joints can, can cause symptoms. Um, but particular joints also have different patterns of pain. So we can have pain coming from a joint that's actually felt in another part of our body. Um, and I'm gonna show you um, exactly what I mean. Now, there's actually been some studies that now show um, that certain joints have uh, certain pain patterns. And I'm gonna pull up an image that demonstrates that in a second here. Um, so overall though, um, when patients have these symptoms, um, we have to kind of dig and see, all right, where are these symptoms coming from? Uh, 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 here we go. So this is a, an example of the different referral patterns of pain that come from the facet joints. And you can see that it's kind of all over the place. So, you know, the upper cervical facets, C2, C3, can cause symptoms into the back of the head or headaches. Uh, C3, 4 could be towards the top of the head. C4, 5 can go all the way into the traps regions. C5, 6, C6, 7 can go even lower down. And there's actually quite a bit of overlap between these areas. What's not mentioned in this are the uppermost cervical facets, the C01 and C12 joints. And these are joints that, that we're gonna talk about more in the future um, when we talk also about um, craniocervical instability um, and upper cervical conditions. But these joints can cause headaches. Um, irritation to these joints can cause uh, some of that grittiness or sand type sensation that you can actually hear um, and, and irritation to these joints, and particularly instability of these joints, can actually cause a lot of various other symptoms, including things like um, an increased blood, uh, blood pressure, an increased heart rate, um, and dizziness, fogginess, uh, brain fog, um, even things like uh, memory issues and and vague numbness, tingling, hearing changes, all of these various different things can be associated with uh, irritation to arthritis of, or more commonly even instability of the C01 and C12 joints. So there are a lot of different things that could be caused by um, the joints. Um, and when we think about it, uh, it's actually kind of amazing uh, to see that it's, it's not like you know, it's my knee arthritis that's bothering me, so I have pain in my knee, right? Um, the thing about the spine and arthritis in the spine in general, but particularly the neck, is that irritation to a specific joint can actually cause issues in different places. Now, uh, Doretta said, does prolotherapy help? Um, as I have it for my sacroiliac conditions, as I have very lax ligaments, and it's been very helpful to me. This is so informative and helpful, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm glad this is informative for you, Doretta. Um, prolotherapy um, is, is, is a treatment involving sugar water injections. And what the sugar water injections do is actually cause a little bit of micro inflammation and irritation to an area that is injected. And that essentially tricks the body into thinking that there's a new injury in that area um, when it's been something that's been going on for a long time. Prolotherapy could actually be really helpful for injuries or laxity of ligament structures. Um, really, really helpful at strengthening various ligament structures. So if you have hypermobility, 
um, or if you have um, uh, you know, an injury such as a whiplash that can cause injury to the ligaments of the neck, then prolotherapy can actually be really, really beneficial for that. Um, if it's more substantial of an injury or if it's something that's been going on for a long time, then other treatments such as blood PRP or platelet-rich plasma uh, may be a stronger treatment than prolotherapy. But ultimately, these things can help with various different neck conditions. Um, may or may not be the optimal choice for a condition such as osteoarthritis. When we have some degeneration of the joint, if it is mild or moderate, particularly if it's early on, and if we're starting to get that degeneration, and especially if we're starting to get that degeneration because we're having some looseness of the ligaments and some laxity that's occurring, then the sugar water dextrose prolotherapy injections can actually be very beneficial, injected specifically directly into the facet joints with appropriate image guidance, which is x-ray fluoroscopy guidance to ensure that we're directly in the joint, um, as well as into and around the joint, um, such as the joint capsule, as well as other ligaments throughout the area um, to tr try to provide stability to the region. That's something that could theoretically help with the pain associated with the osteoarthritis and theoretically provide some stability and, and, and slow down the degenerative process in theory. As the arthritis starts to get worse though, things like when you're getting into the moderate category of osteoarthritis, um, then, then prolotherapy alone, it may take multiple, multiple sessions, but it might be more beneficial to address it with something stronger like PRP, platelet-rich plasma, which will help calm down the inflammation and have a little bit more of a robust reaction in terms of trying to wake up the biology of that joint. Because as I mentioned, um, the biology of the joint starts to get a little bit less active as we get older, as the arthritis progressively worsens. So doing something a little bit stronger in terms of um, you know, waking up that environment could be more beneficial. And as that joint becomes much more severe and the local cells that live in that region are not functioning as well, well, that's the type of situation where we may want to use a patient's own bone marrow um, which contains a rich supply of fresh bone marrow cells as well as a lot of other ingredients, that might be a better treatment for the facet joints because it's such much more of a robust reaction in order to try to wake up the cells that live in that region. Now, really it comes down to is matching the right treatment to the right condition. And in this type of circumstance, not only treating the joint that is the pain generator, but also potentially the structural elements around that joint, such as the ligaments, such as the muscles, such as even going into the epidural space where the nerves are, um, to really look at the whole picture, provide stability for the joint. So not only improving the pain from the joint itself, but trying to provide some longevity by addressing the whole functional spinal unit. Now this is vastly, vastly different than the traditional treatments for osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis, um, the traditional treatments for osteoarthritis in the neck would be really one of two things. Uh, well, one of two interventional things, one of two injection treatments could be beneficial for osteoarthritis in the neck. The first most fundamental treatment really across the board is exercise to strengthen the muscles and get the body moving correctly. Doing that and using the right anti-inflammatory nutrition, you know, staying clean, hydrated, making yourself uh, optimized for healing from the inside out, those type of things can really be the most fundamental treatments for osteoarthritis in the neck and anywhere in the body. But if that's not enough, the traditional treatment for osteoarthritis in the neck would be one of two things. Either one, doing a cortisone injection directly into the facet joint, which can calm down the inflammation of the joint, um, but ultimately only lasts for a few months. Um, and ultimately, if we continue to do repeated, repeated, repeated injections of cortisone, that can make the arthritis worse. And then the second potential treatment would be do, to do something called a radiofrequency ablation. 
So there's small little tiny tiny nerves that go to the facet joints of the neck and those small tiny little nerves um, you can get an injection treatment to just use numbing solution to dull those nerves um, and basically decrease the, the, the signals of pain that are coming from the facet joint. And if that does successfully dull those pain signals and decrease pain, the follow-up procedure would be what's called a radiofrequency ablation, where they used a modified needle tip to burn or deactivate those tiny little nerves that go to the facet joints. Therefore, you have longer standing pain relief, right? It doesn't do anything for the arthritis itself or the condition that's causing the arthritis, but it, it decreases the pain signals that we're getting from the facet joints. This is a great pain management treatment. However, um, I think these type of treatments should be reserved for the more significant arthritic neck conditions, and particularly when we're getting older, because these, can, these treatments um, can help with dulling the nerve sensation in terms of feeling um, the pain from the facet joints, but these tiny, tiny little nerves also go to some of the small little muscles of the neck, um, which as we get older and as there's significant arthritis, those muscles really aren't active anyway. They start to atrophy or get replaced by fat as we get older in general. But when we're younger, those muscles are very, very active and they're actually very important at providing stability of the neck. So if we deactivate the nerve signal that goes to those muscles, then that has theoretically the potential of causing worse issues down the line. So the radiofrequency ablation, again, could be a very reasonable option for older patients with more significant osteoarthritis of the neck facet joints. Um, and if the, the medial branch block or the nerve block procedure does show that it's decreasing the pain sufficiently, then that's actually a really reasonable pain management treatment um, but vastly different than using orthobiologics such as a patient's own PRP um, or dextrose prolotherapy, sugar water injections, um, or other solutions to, to help structurally the different elements um, of, of the neck arthritis. Um, so K.A. Rim said, now I'm feeling super after five treatments. All the heart symptoms are gone. Um, did PRP to the C0 to C2, prolotherapy to C3 to C7. So that's an example of, of strengthening the ligaments, the structures around the neck, and actually improving symptoms that for all intents and purposes are far away from the neck, right? Heart symptoms and things along those lines. Susan says, hi, Dr. Patel. Sorry I'm late again. Hoped you were too. I am often late. This time I was only like a couple minutes late, Susan, but thanks so much for joining. And all, as always, thanks for the rubber bands. Um, but overall, I, I hope this all made sense. I hope this was helpful for you guys. Um, you know, there's a lot that takes place um, in the neck region. Um, there's a lot of anatomy that I think is really important. So go back and watch my other videos in regards to the anatomy. Um, but osteoarthritis is a normal, normal thing that occurs as we get older. Um, it's it's oftentimes in reaction to little micro movements that take place over time. Um, it can be related to when patients have increased mobility in the neck or hypermobility, um, you know, whiplash injuries or things along those lines can, can lead up to osteoarthritis. Ultimately, it's wear and tear of the cartilage um, and, 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 and some roughness to the bone, sometimes bulkiness of the bone or bone spurs, um, and, and eventually breaking down of the bone and sometimes even autofusion of one bone to the other. And, and that whole spectrum, really none of the whole spectrum actually has to be painful, but if we move funny, if we're pro-inflammatory in our food, if we get injuries in that area, then it's easier for these joints to A, get become pain generators or become stiff or become irritated themselves and B, even cause issues in other areas as well. But good news is there's a lot of stuff that we can do about it. Um, I talked a little bit about treatment options today and I'll talk more about that in the future. Again, if there's um, anything else that you want me to discuss about neck arthritis or any other topic, then please feel free to hit me up. If you enjoyed this video, share it, like it, 
um, you know, share it to the groups that you're a part of. I know there's a lot of arthritis groups that are out there that, that I think could benefit from this information. Um, there is hope. There is a lot that we can do. Um, and I, I hope that you're able to, um, you know, do the right things for yourself. Be an advocate for yourself. Learn. Uh, watch these videos and videos of everybody else that are out there so you can learn, 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 and, and um, be an advocate for your own health. Um, so hope you guys enjoyed. Have a great, great weekend, and I will see you next week.